Scores posted for exam three. I'll put up the key soon. Once again, I succeeded to bungle a couple of questions. So everybody got credit for the questions that I bungled. 14 a pop for the questions on Q on exam three. And BQ3 is being developed. I started scribbling up some evil ideas yesterday afternoon and I'm working further on these evil ideas. Which of course will be subject to you after I finish inventing BQ3. You'll see it by no later than Sunday. Just keep check on the website. Will it be due on Tuesday? That's the last. Will it be due on Tuesday? I've decided BQ3 will be due a week from today because I'm going to run an exam review. So even if you're not of a mind to attend the exam review, since this time slot corresponds to our class, I don't think it's asking too much. For those of you who are of a mind to turn this in for credit, to at least see me for that. I expect to get this room for the review, but I don't know yet. I've asked for it to be reserved. If I don't get this room, I'll get a different room. And if you don't get that room, room. What is that? <laughs> I'll get a room, don't worry about that part of the puzzle. Maybe it'll be the O'Connell Center. What the hell do I care? <coughs> and I will direct you right now to make ready for the stuff we'll wrestle with during our last few gatherings and stuff about which you'll surely be asked on BQ3 and the final. In chapter 24. Which bears the title, Transition Metal Coordination Chemistry. The most important property of any species is what? Structure. You will see much of the discussion that's in chapter 24 devoted to the issue of structure of coordination complexes which relates directly to a very important property of transition metal complexes called isomerism. You want to do yourself a big favor? Read through this stuff this weekend and think about it carefully because that's what we're going to focus on. Now to wrap up chapter 23. for which we really have discussed in sufficient detail regarding rationalization of strengths of brownsted lowry acids and bases with the exception of hydrated metal ions we'll talk about it in a moment but before we go to hydrated metal ions you'll notice in chapter 23 I don't remember the question number, but you can find it. HBr, a stronger acid than HCl. We rationalize that on the basis of chloride ion being a good deal smaller anion than bromide ion. So based on electronegativity, you'd expect HCl to be a stronger acid than HBr because chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, but not substantially so. 3.0, Pauling electronegativity for chlorine, 2.8 for bromine. But bromide, which is derived from bromine, is a much larger anion than chloride ion because the bromine atom is a much larger atom than the chlorine atom. So on that basis, we expect negative charge density to be smaller 
for bromide ion because it's a much larger ion than chloride ion. So you're smearing this single unit of minus charge over a much larger surface. Does that fit the facts? Yes. The fact being that HBr is a stronger acid than HCl. Well, what about perchloric acid versus perbromic acid? These acids are also very similar in strength and they're also strong acids. In fact, you may recall in our acid base table that this is listed at the top of the acid column because it's the strongest known mineral acid. Mineral means it's derivable from minerals that exist in Earth's crust. The only difference between these two oxo acids, oxo halo acids, is the central atom. Chlorine here, bromine here. But in this case, the chlorine derivative is the stronger acid. Whereas here, the bromine derivative was the stronger acid. Now, if you write the Lewis structures for the anions of these acids, you get tetrahedral species the perchlorate ion and the perbromate ion. Hybridization identical. Structure, geometry identical. Peripheral atoms identical. The only difference is the central atom. And since bromine is a bigger atom than chlorine, we know perbromate ion is a bigger anion than perchlorate ion. Yet in this case, the chlorine derivative is the stronger acid. So a rationale based on size isn't going to work. Number one, we realize that although bromide ion is a much bigger ion than chloride ion, perbromate ion is not a much bigger ion than perchlorate ion at all. That makes sense to you? How about a quarter and a nickel, just for fun? Quarter is a lot bigger than a nickel. And it's also, value-wise, five times more valuable. Well, what happens if I add five pennies to a quarter and five pennies to a nickel? Do I see the same difference in size? If I did a volume displacement measurement, the quarter displacement is much larger than the nickel displacement. But the quarter plus the five pennies displacement, although it's larger than the nickel plus the five pennies displacement, isn't as large by the same factor. Not nearly as large. How about value? Now I got 30 cents versus 10 cents, don't I? Now the value ratio is 3 to 1. What happens if I add more pennies? Do you see that as I add more pennies, say 10 more pennies, now I got 40 cents versus 20 cents. Now the value ratio is 2 to 1. And the size ratio becomes smaller than it was previously. Does this make sense to you? How the difference in size changes dramatically when I keep on adding these peripheral atoms, all of which are the same size, like adding the pennies to the quarter versus adding the pennies to the nickel. If I got a single basketball and I want to compare its size to a single softball, big difference in size. But if I surround this basketball by a hundred softballs and surround the softball by a hundred softballs, do I have much difference in size now? Not at all. So here, the answer regarding why this is the stronger acid can't depend on size. Here the size difference between the anions is not much. Whereas the size difference between the anions here is significant. So what can we rest on here? Well, now we can lean on electronegativity. 
conduction stabilization, because chlorine is somewhat more electronegative than bromine. And for this case, could we also lean on this? Chlorine and oxygen are different in size. Bromine and oxygen are different in size. But the difference in size between bromine and oxygen is a lot greater than that between chlorine and oxygen. So based on this PMO business, between which atom should we expect stronger covalent bond? Chlorine oxygen, bromine oxygen. Chlorine, Chlorine oxygen. That means a stronger pi system, better resonance. That doesn't mean resonance is great for, for chloride ion because it's not planar. But still it will be a more important property for perchlorate ion than it is for perbromate ion. And those rationales support the facts. So we'll rest our case on that basis. Now hydrated metal ions. First of all, realize there are two distinctly different types of hydrated metal ions. Metal ions which are A family, like hydrated aluminum ion, hydrated calcium ion, hydrated magnesium ion. You did work in 46L with hydrated magnesium ion, hydrated aluminum ion. You found out that hydrated aluminum ion is a much acid strength wise compared to hydrated magnesium ion. Which one? Much stronger. Why so? What's the difference between these two ions as isolated ions? This is smaller and this clearly has a greater positive charge density because it's three halves times as plus as this thing. That means when a water molecule sticks to this, it sticks more strongly and more closely, because this is a smaller ion. Now what accounts for the acidity of a hydrated metal ion? There's H. Too big. The hydrogen ends of the water dipole are the partially positive ends. Squiggle plus here too. The shorter and stronger the aluminum oxygen coordinate covalent bond, the greater is the degree of electrostatic repulsion between the metal ion itself and a hydrogen atom end of a water molecule because these are the partially positive ends of the water molecule. The greater this repulsion, the more easily the oxygen-hydrogen bond cleaves heterolytically and often the solution swims H+. That's how these behave as acids. So the upshot of this is to realize if the hydrated metal ion is A family which in a nutshell means it hasn't got any valence electrons like calcium ion or magnesium ion or beryllium ion or aluminum ion, aluminum ion, hydrate aluminum ion being in our acid base table. The strength of that metal ion when it's hydrated depends strictly and exclusively on positive charge density. So if you can line up the metal ions, provided they're A family, if you can line up the metal ions with respect to relative positive charge densities, you know how their acid strengths compare when they're hydrated. So I'll ask you this. This stronger acid than this. Between these two, which one is stronger? This one. Because even though the metal ions are each plus two, Be plus two is isoelectronic with helium. 
And that's a lot smaller than Mg plus 2, which is isoelectronic with neon. How do you think the acidities of these two might compare? Now please notice, there are competing factors. What are the competing factors? Aluminum ion is more plus, but beryllium ion is smaller. So which has the greater positive charge density? The answer is, prediction-wise, we don't know. So how are we going to find out? There's only one way to find out in science class. That's go to the lab and make measurements. And what do we find out? Their Ka values are damn near identical. How about that? Well, if their Ka values are damn near identical, how do their charge densities compare? They're damn near identical. How about that? Because you got two plus smeared on a smaller surface. Hey. Now then, to go further with the point about this charge density idea being applicable only to hydrated metal ions if the metal ion is A family, do you believe if Fe3 plus floated in here and you could see it, and next to it aluminum 3 plus floated in here and you could see it. Two positive ions, that's all. Which one would be larger? Iron 3 plus or aluminum 3 plus? Aluminum 3 plus is isoelectronic with neon. Aluminum 3 plus, I mean iron 3 plus, not only has all the electrons that aluminum ion has, it's got a hell of a lot more, doesn't it? Which of these would you expect to be larger? Did we not recognize as you go from period to period, the general observation is that sizes get progressively larger? If I have an iron atom all by itself, an aluminum atom all by itself, which atom would you expect to be larger? Iron. Well then, does it not follow that iron plus three should be observed to be a lot larger iron than aluminum plus three? Yes. The data bear this out. They show this to be the case. The upshot of this is to realize, if I'm going to argue the acidity of hydrated iron plus three on the basis of a charge to size ratio model, I have a difficulty a serious difficulty because Ka for the iron species is 4 times 10 to minus 3 versus 1.4 for K times 10 to minus 5 is Ka for hydrate aluminum ion. This thing is a much stronger acid than this. So can I use this simple positive charge density model? Hell no! It falls apart. Now we really haven't had much time to talk about the stuff at the start of chapter 23 so that you might be in better position to appreciate this. But if I look at the valence electron configuration for iron plus 3, what do I see present? Well, here's iron number 26. What's the configuration for iron in the atom? Iron the atom. 26 Fe. Argon core, that accounts for 18 electrons. Well, I gotta pop in eight more electrons to get to this configuration, don't I? Because there's 26 total. So it's gonna be argon core, 3D, how many? And notice that, even though we put in the S, the S electrons before the D electrons, as soon as you put in as few as one D electron, the D sublevel becomes lower in energy. How do I know this? When I ionize the iron atom, or when I ionize any transition metal atom, which has got this mixed bag of valence electrons, D and S, 
Which electrons go first, the D or the S? The S always go first because they are higher quantum level electrons. That's a nice rule to follow because there are no exceptions known to it. When you look at a transition metal atom, all of which have this mixed bag of valence electrons, N value S electrons and N minus 1 value D electrons. Like for period 4, 4S four electrons, 3D electrons. For period 5, 5S electrons, 4D electrons. For period 6, 6S six electrons, 5D electrons. Yes, electrons always go first. So independent of how I develop this configuration, when I write the configuration, I'm going to write it like this to remind me these are lower energy electrons. So when I operate on this thing to turn it into iron plus three, I lose these two electrons and one of these. So I still got five 3D valence electrons. Now we get to the salient point of this. D electrons and D orbitals. Again, we didn't talk much about this, but if you looked at the videos, you'll know what we're driving at. D electrons and D orbitals. How effectively do they shield? Aren't they really poor? Poor shielding electrons. What are the strongest shielding electrons? S, because they're the best penetrators. On a time average basis, S electrons relative to the same energy level electrons. S, P, D, F, if they're all in the same energy level. The S electrons, even though they determine size, cause the most probable distance from the radius for S electron in a given energy level is farther from the nucleus. Quantum mechanical studies bear this out. Then P electrons or D electrons or F electrons of the same quantum number. Yet on a time average basis, these S electrons are still closer to the nucleus. Screwy things, these electrons, aren't they? Because of this wave character. They're not points. They're not in a position exactly at any time. They're all over the place at any time because of this wave character. So not only is this S electron furthest from the nucleus on a time average basis, it's closest to the nucleus on a time average basis. That's a funny damn thing. I wish I could behave like that. And while people did exams, I'd be hovering over the shoulders of everyone. And I'd say, Where's the PSI? What? <laughs> you didn't write it. <laughs> that Lewis structure is wrong. What? Do it again. <laughs> Sorry, I watched the video, but could you explain uh, this concept of shielding again? Well, what's going on here is that we're not going to take any time to talk about shielding. You can look at the video. But what this amounts to is. 3D electrons or D electrons in general do not shield effectively. That means, as I see it, when a water molecule, here's now iron plus three. When a water molecule makes a coordinate covalent bond with this thing, the water molecule is using a non-bonding pair, which of course becomes a bonding pair, for what energy level? The valence electrons of an oxygen atom. In what energy level do they reside? Energy level number two. Are these pretty strongly penetrating electrons? Yeah. And if they're going to penetrate through this poorly shielding collection of D electrons, they have the opportunity to approach a nucleus which has got how many protons in it? 26. Which means the water molecule makes a stronger coordinate covalent bond with iron plus 3 than it does with aluminum plus 3. And now I can recognize why. I wind up with a greater degree of repulsion between centers of positive charge. Namely the nucleus of iron plus 3 and the hydrogen atom ends of a coordinated water molecule.
And now I get a way to rationalize why these transition metal ions, when they're hydrated, are unusually strong acids. Same for post-transition metal ions. Hydrated gallium ion, for example, this thing. Here's hydrated aluminum ion. Here's hydrated gallium ion. They're both hexahydrates. They're both octahedral ions. Gallium. Same family as aluminum. Right? Both plus three ions. Which of these do you think is the stronger acid? Clearly gallium plus three is a lot bigger than aluminum plus three. Which do you think is the stronger acid? If I write down Ka for this thing, am I going to get a bigger number than this or a smaller number? Because you have to realize that gallium plus three is or is not like an A family atom. Or put a better way, a noble gas structure atom. Because aluminum plus three is a noble gas structure atom. Ion, pardon me. Calcium plus two, beryllium plus two, those are noble gas structure ions. How about gallium plus three? Is that a noble gas structure ion? Yes. No, because gallium plus three has got, well, here's go iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and then we got the gallium. Gallium's got a full complement of 3D electrons, all of which are lousy shielders. So when these coordinated water molecules for gallium plus three burrow through these poor, poorly shielding d-electrons, they're looking at a nucleus which has got, count them, 31 protons. And that gives me a way to recognize why hydrated gallium ion is a lot stronger acid than hydrated aluminum ion. Interesting. Um, is hydrated ion stronger than hydrated gallium? Uh, it may well be. I don't remember the data, but I know it's a strong acid and stronger than hydrate aluminum ion. You can look this stuff up on the web. Enough on this. I should have wrote just a family. NGS, noble gas structure, that's what counts. And now we begin to lay foundation for chapter 24. Transition metal coordination chemistry. And the way we shall lay this foundation is to take a look at the very last stuff that's considered in chapter 23, which I purposely placed at the tail end of chapter 23 because it's part of metallurgy, which is the chemistry that's discussed at the end of chapter 23, and because this particular aspect of metallurgy is a marvelous springboard in the chapter 24 on transition metal coordination chemistry. Metallurgy. I'm sure a word that you've all heard. It's just a general word term that applies to processes which are mainly chemistry that allow us to dig ore samples from Mother Earth. that contain metals, like aluminum oxide, iron oxide, stuff like that. Because it is from these minerals, mainly oxides, but they're not always oxides, sometimes they're sulfides, etc., of metals that we operate on to get the metal itself. You know aluminum, particularly iron, very important metals in our eco economy. So you do a geological survey, you find out some territory in Earth's crust which is rich in aluminum oxide. If you work at Alcoa or Reynolds or wherever they make aluminum products, and you send out your steam shovel, take a big chunk of Mother Earth and send it back to the factory where you reduce the oxide to get aluminum. Same for iron. I was born in where I was born and raised in Toledo, Ohio. Just a few blocks from my house was a Bessemer plant where iron was made. When we were little kids, we used to like to watch this. Go down there at night and you see these big fire 
fires blasting out of these huge Bessemer furnaces. And guys pushing wheelbarrows full of stuff. Hey, in the late 40s and early 50s, we didn't have a lot of mechanized stuff like we have today. Watching wheelbarrows and stuff, iron ores being dumped into the top of these Bessemer furnaces, which were huge. Listening to my grandfather, oftentimes after he painted the house, cuss vehemently in Hungarian. Because I'm Hungarian, both sides of the fence. Because just after he painted the house, the wind blew from the wrong direction and blew the soot from the Bessemer. <laughs> landed on the fresh paint. And he'd be out there saying, I, I shouldn't repeat the words. But I know the words. <laughs> In any case, the specific metallurgical consideration which is of interest for us to be springboard into chapter 24 is that of the purification of nickel. An important metal, not nearly as important as iron and aluminum and copper, but still important. Nickel shows a lot of chemical similarities to cobalt. Probably not surprising to you since they're neighbors. Atomic number 27 cobalt, 28 is nickel. And a long time ago, a chemist named Mond, M-O-N-D, discovered that. If you take nickel, which is contaminated with cobalt, metals, obtained after you reduce nickel oxides or nickel sulfide ores, copper cobalt oxide, cobalt sulfide ores, to get the base metals, you still had nickel contaminated with cobalt. Yeah, you gotta get the cobalt out of there if you need pure nickel. What Mon found out is that if you take this nickel contaminated with cobalt and treat it with carbon monoxide vapor, cobalt, carbon monoxide, I have to write this down. You and 46 L this term or past terms. Remember in assignment two, you made some rather fancy precipitates using cobalty nitride ion. Cobalty nitride ion had cobalt in its composition. C small o NO2 sub 6 3 minus. Oftentimes I've had students in the laboratory write the formula for cobalty nitrite ion. So I ask them to write equations for reactions. And they write the formula like this. And they come to me and I get out my red pen and I do this. And they're looking at me, what's wrong with that? So take it back, figure it out. You just turn this baby into the carbon monoxide when you write this. Hey, communication is important. You gotta be careful about this stuff. Now back to this. At this very low temperature, lower than the boiling point temperature of water, nickel reacts with carbon monoxide molecules to make this very interesting material called nickel tetracarbonyl, which at this low temperature is a gas. That leads us to our first consideration. Do you believe this reaction is redox? Because until this time, every compound you've looked at, every formula you've considered in chemistry class, which contain metal and non-metal atoms, like this, metal, non-metal, non-metal, Every formula you've so far seen which contains metal as well as non-metal atoms has always had the metal in what kind of an oxidation state relative to the non-metal atoms? Positive. All the time. Now then, if this thing is redox, would you expect nickel to be the reducer? Well, that by default would make carbon monoxide the oxidizer electrons would be exchanged 
And if electrons were exchanged in this reaction, this kind of compound would be what kind of compound? Ionic or molecular? Ionic. Are you familiar with the properties of ionic compounds under normal laboratory conditions? Are you familiar with the properties of ionic compounds at 60 to 80 degrees centigrade? You are. Tell me what they are. They're distinctly and exclusively what? Crystalline solids. This damn stuff's a gas. Do you think it's ionic? No. Not at all. So what we're looking at here is not an example of redox reaction, but instead an example of Lewis acid, Lewis base chemistry, coordination chemistry. That's why it's a springboard to chapter 24. This is a molecular stuff, nickel tetracarbonyl. It's a molecular stuff in which the oxidation state of nickel in forming this compound has not changed at all, because this is not a redox reaction. So guess what the oxidation state then is of nickel in this stuff? What is it? Zero. Zero. How about that? Now then. Carbon monoxide as a ligand. What's this word ligand? I think we mentioned this before. That's a transition metal chemist name for a Lewis base. That's all it is. Lewis base, LB. Transition metal chemists call these things ligands. You can look this up on Wikipedia and stuff and find out why it's called ligand. History of chemistry. What I want you to do is on your paper right now write a Lewis picture for carbon monoxide because we're trying to get at the issue of the nature of coordinating by carbon monoxide molecules. And a carbon monoxide molecule behaves as a ligand, behaves as a Lewis base, in this case making a bond to nickel atoms, since nickel's preserved its oxidation state during this reaction. Which end of the carbon monoxide molecule engages in bond formation with nickel? Did you get this? No other possible Lewis structure you can write for this thing. Total number of electrons, 10. You remember the formalism? Which is an important formalism to remember. In all even electron, 10's an even number, right? That's what even electron means. In all even electron species, molecular species which are stable and which contain carbon and or oxygen and or nitrogen. CNO. CNO atoms in such species are exclusively and always octet. And there is a very valuable application of the idea of octet. I find students coming to me in 2046, they got this octet rule all screwed up. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. In stable, even electron species. In such species, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, always octets. And carbon, always four bonds, unless you have an unusual species like this, where there's three bonds instead of four. But when you deal with, which is arguably the most common category of organic molecules, hydrocarbons, carbon always four bonds for hydrocarbon molecules, which are stable. All right? Now then, you see anything unusual about this Lewis structure? Do you remember that after writing a Lewis structure, you have a device which you should apply to constructively criticize the Lewis structure? What is that device? Formal, formal charge. Put the formal charges on this thing. You 
you see anything unusual about this formal charge distribution? Because you know, if at all possible, when you write a Lewis structure, and formal charge distribution is found, if at all possible, negative formal charge should be on the atom which is of greater electronegativity. That doesn't follow for this baby. But bond strength length studies demand we recognize the presence of this triple bond. And if you do not write a carbon monoxide molecule Lewis structure with a triple bond, there's no way you can satisfy the octet requirement for both carbon and oxygen. That drives us to the triple bond. Secondly, in passing, I will tell you, this is the second strongest bond known in the world of chemistry. This triple bond. Here's number three. We'll tell you what number one is with continuing conversation, but I will also tell you that number one is contained in our bond length strength table, which is in chapter 23. It's the nitrous sodium cation. There, I've given you its name. You want its formula? I'll give you its formula. There it is. Never mind that for now. Let's go back to carbon monoxide. Our LS analysis shows us that there's a non-bonding pair at each end of this molecule. But the LS analysis also shows us that formal charge analysis suggests that which end of this molecule has the greater negative charge density? Carbon. And which atom is more likely to be willing, so to speak, to share its non-bonding electron density to make a coordinate covalent bond because it is of lower electronegativity and stabilizes its non-bonding pair less effectively? Carbon. Carbon. How about that? Result? The sigma coordinate covalent bond, that forms when nickel atom reacts with carbon monoxide molecule, four of them, to make this thing. Always forms as a result of non-bonding pair from carbon being used to make the bond. Studies show when carbon monoxide behaves as a ligand, a Lewis base, I don't care what it reacts with. It's always the carbon non-bonding pair that does the bonding. Never the oxygen non-bonding pair. With that you can tell me Which end of this will make the coordinate covalent bond if this interesting species does liganding stuff? You can think about that. We'll talk about that later. Okay? Now then, let's look at this question, number 63. Nickel tetracarbonyl is diamagnetic, after which I've written so. There must be an upshot to this. To recognize the upshot. Let's look at the configuration for nickel atom. There it is. You know how to write this stuff because you did this in 2045. If I do this with a box diagram, Where go the other four D electrons? Because this thing is 3D8. Did you learn about Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity? What's that mean? You have to fill them all up? We haven't filled up anything yet. <laughs> I can't fill them all up. I gotta have 10 electrons to fill them all up. 
filled him up in order. What does Hunt's rule of maximum multiplicity mean? Means that electrons go further away before they go closer together. Before they pair. Like, they occupy different suborbitals or suborbitals before they before they share them. Share. Exist in the same. Exist in the same orbital. Does that mean make sense to you? Yeah. I'll ask you if in 2045 you heard about this. Pairing energy. Did you hear about that? <coughs> How in the hell can you talk about Hunt's rule without talking about pairing energy? I got to talk to these 2045 people. <laughs> the pairing energy is the term applied to the extra energy that you must spend to get two electrons to live in the same orbital. Because when they live in the same orbital, they're as close to each other as they can possibly be. And electrons. Attract or repel each other? Yeah. Repel. Because they're about the same sign, charge-wise. So what Hunt's rule is really telling you is, if I got a bunch of orbitals which are all the same energy, then if I'm going to add more than four electrons to a 3D sublevel, as I must to develop this 3D8 configuration for the nickel atom, this happens before this happens. Because if I do this, I have to spend the pairing energy. Well, I don't want to spend the pairing energy. That costs more than this. But now I have to spend pairing energy. And there's the configuration. So the upshot of this analysis is to realize the nickel atom by itself is or is not paramagnetic. It is. It is. Remember paramagnetic? That's a term applied to any species which in its configuration has got one or more half-filled orbitals. Singly occupied orbitals. Now, remember what I wrote up here? Nickel tetracarbonyl is diamagnetic. What the heck does that mean? That means when nickel atoms reacted with carbon monoxide molecules, something unusual happened to this configuration, didn't it? It had to change. How did it change? As if by magic, because of the thermodynamic drive to make that stuff, the bonds, these two 4s electrons, when the carbon monoxide molecules approach to bond with nickel, these two 4s electrons jump back here. And in come the four carbon monoxide molecules, each of which supplies a non-bonding pair, taking residence in these valence orbitals of nickel. This orbital got freed up by this bond formation interaction, and these orbitals were there and empty previously. Now they get filled. Now why should I believe this story? Well, the damn thing is diamagnetic. So something happened to happen with those previously two half-filled D orbitals that we had before. And this tells me the hybridization for nickel in nickel tetracarbonyl is what? S, P1, P2, P3. What kind of geometry you associate with SP3 hybridization? Tetrahedral. So are we surprised when we take some nickel tetracarbonyl to the lab and do structure studies on it and find out that it's tetrahedral? No. Oh, we're not surprised at all. How about that? Interesting, isn't it? So we looked as if something magic has happened here. By coordination, in this case of nickel with carbon monoxide, the bond formation interaction is so strong that it drives reconfiguration for nickel valence electrons. Went from paramagnetic to diamagnetic. Interesting, isn't it? Now, one more consideration. We're running a couple minutes over, but I want to ask one more consideration. Do you think the stability of something like nickel tetracarbonyl is attributed to the strength exclusively of this sigma bond? Do you think carbon monoxide is an effective 
electron pair donor. This thing inductively stabilizes electron density, doesn't it? This thing retards the ability of this to be an electron pair donor. Do you think nickel in the zero oxidation state is a strong electron pair acceptor? Hell no, it's zero oxidation state. A strong electron pair acceptor is something which is positive. This thing isn't positive. The upshot of which is to realize the stability of an unusual material like nickel tetracarbonyl cannot be attributed to these sigma bonds. What they are attributed to is pi bonds. How about that? So next time, among other things, we'll talk about pi bonding between nickel and carbon monoxide and other metal atoms and unusual transition metal complexes.